Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 319, Thoughts on My Debate with Rogers About Mark, Part 1, Culture Clash. I'm a true believer in the tradition of formal debates. This tradition derives from medieval universities, really from professors of theology, and I think it's a great tradition because it puts a high value on truth and reason and rational argument. Debates also necessarily add a little element of drama that draw people in, and it provides a rare occasion on which a person can hear the other side fully make out their case, or at least as fully as the case can be made in 15, 20, 30 minutes, etc. Of course, the trouble with debates is, for one thing, you always think of a great comeback like the next day, (laughs) and because of the ebb and flow of conversation and argument, you never end up covering all of the relevant issues and texts. There are always loose ends in a debate. And when it's a good debate, there's always a lot you can learn by kind of doing a post-mortem afterwards. If you're interested in doing that, my friend Trey Brickley has constructed a debate map in which he records, as far as I can tell accurately, the back and forth of the different questions and answers and arguments that were given. So check out the blog post for this episode at trinities.org if you're interested in going that deep with this debate. Now, several people who followed the podcast basically said, why would you sign up for this sort of thing? this guy's rude, he's rough. Why would you put yourself out there to be insulted by this guy? Well, there's two reasons why I agreed to the debate. One reason is just that I was confident in my overall case about interpreting Mark as presented in my opening statement. I don't think Rogers put a dent in it at all, and I think my case is transparently stronger than his opening case, which incorporates a lot of controversial points of interpretation. I knew what I was getting into, This sort of popular apologetics crowd is a rough one. If you'd like to see how rough, just find the original YouTube of this debate and look at the comments on the right-hand side of the page as the debate goes on. For people like Rogers, this is a game of domination, basically. They think their job is to humiliate me and show me up as just a stupid loser uh, who doesn't know what he's doing and is totally incompetent and uh, moreover is just a very bad man because he's spiritually blind and he can't see just the obvious mean of the text. My goal going into this is to make a stronger argument and to try to point out the weaknesses of his argument. So I knew going in that we were playing by two different sets of rules. The mocking game, I'm going to let them win that. To me, it's not a personal grudge match, and I'm exploring these things in part to help you, the listener, decide where you want to spend your mental energy. It's to help you to understand why he thinks my views are crazy and surely just spiritually blind, and why I am totally unimpressed by his arguments. Still, you might ask, why is it worth it? Well, I'll tell you. When I was in high school and going into college, I was a fanboy of popular apologetics. Now, back in my day, we didn't have the internet. We had popular publications, magazines, and the radio. And I was listening to fast-talking pseudo-scholars like Hank Hanegraaff and, I'm embarrassed to say, Bob Larson, and reading books by very dodgy scholars like Walter Martin. And I was attracted by the rough and tumble of it. You know, I wanted to see the heretics be put in their place. I liked the excitement of it. But also, I was interested in the truth of the matter. And I didn't have the tools as a high school student to distinguish between a real scholar and someone who just talks fast and is extremely confident in their opinions. What happened was, when I got to college and started to hang around with, you know, professors of philosophy and theology and other things... I found that they didn't act like these apologetics guys that I was used to following. 
They were interested in arguments and disagreements and in important issues. They had that in common, but they didn't act like them. They didn't feel any need to try to belittle and humiliate their opponents. They really just focused on the arguments. They focused on making careful and sound arguments themselves and then carefully picking apart what are the weaknesses in the other side's arguments. And I was already starting to realize that guys like Hank Hanegraaff were really getting a lot of mileage out of just verbal aggression and being the guy who controls the mute button on the radio. Okay, what does this have to do with my debate? I'm trying to communicate with the fanboys of people like Anthony Rogers or David Wood or Sam Shamoon, who are like the younger Dale Tuggy, in that they don't really know the difference between a serious scholar and a fast talker who's good at memorizing proof texts. And yet they are interested in the truth of the matter. And they are interested, ultimately, in separating the stronger arguments from the weaker. So I'm willing to take a lot of abuse by the uncouth fanboys um, so I can reach that, I don't know, 5% or 10% or whatever it is, who are more serious. Because the fact is, there's a world of relevant scholarship that they're not going to know about if they only listen to people like Anthony Rogers, as I'll explain. I do find it frustrating to debate people who are not scholars or whose main business is popular apologetics, not because they're rude, but just because they don't understand my views. I've spent two decades developing my views on this subject, and these folks just don't spend the time and effort it takes to read things that I've written so that they can understand what I think and why. They just don't care too much about that. You know, They're wanting to get their own proof text out there. Also, what's frustrating is just the sheer volume of distracting misinformation. And I think that really did detract from the quality of this debate, as I'll explain. What would have made the debate better, I think, is if we had given each other our opening statements a week in advance. This way, we would have been able to engage better with the other person's opening statements. It's very hard to process just on the fly, you know, one minute after you heard it, and to come up with a really deep uh, and incisive rebuttal. This is what Chris Dade and I did in our debate, and I think it really made it a better debate. I didn't suggest it this time just because I was busy and didn't have my argument ready a week in advance, so I couldn't suggest sharing it. If we had done that, I would have had a lot more to say about his new Exodus argument. A lot of his overall case really just depended on a brutal misunderstanding of the opening verses of the Gospel according to Mark. But another part of his argument was that Mark is clearly presenting the events in his gospel as a new exodus, because Jesus is doing all the same miracles, or maybe the same general sorts of miracles, in the same order, and clearly this would communicate that now God has come in person. Here's one place in Roger's post-debate discussion with his followers where he kind of summarizes his case that in Mark, Jesus is God. Dale is being an obscurantist. I didn't say that in the debate, but uh, he was, right? Here's Jesus being called the Lord. Old Testament Lord texts are used for him. He does what the Lord does. He does them in the order the Lord does them. He does them uh, in a way that's described in exactly the same way that it's described for God in the Old Testament. All these things, you have to be characterized by a special kind of blindness to say that sort of thing. Blindness, hmm? Right. What takes blindness is managing to ignore all of the many differences between Jesus and God that are assumed by this book, and which also are implied by one's own theological commitments. If one can somehow ignore all of those differences, one can then turn around and think, oh, well, Jesus just is God. They're one and the same. Okay, now about this new Exodus argument. What I would have said if I had been better prepared going in, if I knew he was going to make this sort of argument, again, keep in mind the genre of this book as I explained it. This book was clearly meant to be understood by ordinary Christians, and so its main thesis needs to be clear, not something that only a hint-hunting scholar can excavate out of it with great effort. Do you really think that, say, a craftsman who does have some Old Testament knowledge is going to say, aha, Jesus stills the winds and the waves. This is just like the parting of the Red Sea. Jesus casts demons out and they go into pigs and the pigs drown. Aha, that's just like when the Pharaoh and his army drowned. Jesus feeds 5,000 with bread and loaves and some fish. 
aha, this is just like when God miraculously feeds Israel in the wilderness with manna from heaven. <laughs> really? Now, in the debate, I granted that there's a new Exodus theme here in that there are allusions and sort of oblique gestures at the Exodus by way of certain language and descriptions. But I don't think that your average reader is going to say, aha, this is a new Exodus. And here's the real kicker. Jesus isn't parallel to Moses. Jesus is God himself. I think we can be pretty sure that if an early reader or listener picked up an Exodus connection in this book, it's going to lead him to compare Jesus to Moses, not to God. And it's certainly not going to lead him to think that Jesus is the Lord God Almighty himself. Why do we know this? Well, in Acts 3.22, we read that Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you from your own people a prophet like me. You must listen to whatever he tells you. And this is claiming that Jesus is the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18.15, where Moses says, Yahweh your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people, and you shall heed such a prophet. And we know from other things that are said in this book that Jesus is a prophet, although, of course, we also know he's much greater than ordinary prophets, and even greater than Moses. Another reason I agreed to debate Rogers is that his perspective as a Jesus is God apologist has some significant influence with the laity, I think. There's a certain combination of views, demonstrably confused, unfortunately, that have some appeal to the ordinary Christian. Now, one thing that happened in the debate was I referred to his views as fringe. And clearly, I hit a nerve when I said this because he brought it up again in the debate and in his long follow-up session with his followers, which I slogged through, which was done later that day on YouTube. He comes back to this fringe charge over and over. Of course, I could have been a lot clearer about what I meant was fringe. This Jesus is God perspective about the Bible would be very fringe in scholarship, but it's not fringe as concerns the laity. And of course, there is now a cottage industry of churning out new and creative ways to try to show that the deity of Christ is taught in the New Testament. And of course, they're typically none too clear about what they mean by the deity of Christ. Is that fringe? In the broad world of scholarship, that's one sort of corner of it, but I wouldn't call that fringe. But what are fringe are at least four things. First of all, his views about the New Testament use of the Old Testament are totally fringe and something that I think just an informed layperson can dismiss. Second, his view that the Jews before Christianity were Trinitarian, super fringe. Don't take my word for it. Here's what Dr. John H. Walton says, who is professor of Old Testament at Wheaton College and Graduate School. In his book, Old Testament Theology for Christians, From Ancient Context to Enduring Belief, he writes this, and this is in a list of 10 ways in which Old Testament theology differs from New Testament theology. This is what he says, quote, No Trinity, period. The understanding of the Trinity is entailed in the recognition of Christ as incarnate God, in consequence of which the Holy Spirit is understood as having been sent to indwell Christians. Now, Just to pause for a second, that's not enough to get a triune God, but let me continue. In the Old Testament, God's revelation centered on the idea that there was one God as opposed to a community of gods. The metaphysical models that would make Trinitarianism meaningful simply do not exist in the Israelite cultural context. In some passages of the Old Testament, Christians can look back and catch glimpses of some nascent Trinitarianism But such hindsight interpretations cannot be construed as a revelation of God in the Old Testament context and do not factor into the theology of the Old Testament. Now, Mr. Rogers has his favorite scholars here, and it's an interesting topic that I can't spend a lot of time on in this episode. In short, several recent, like still living Jewish Bible scholars kind of want to steal the Christian's thunder and say, hey, all these neat ideas about incarnation and Trinity, we really had them first. And you can find these ideas in the Old Testament and the intertestamental literature. The problem with them, though, is they're very loosey-goosey on what they're counting as, quote, Trinitarian. The way they put it a lot of times is in terms of divine plurality. 
So, if God can appear in multiple ways, that's divine plurality. If God really is multiple persons, that's divine plurality. If God has different powers, that's divine plurality. If God operates through lesser deities, that's divine plurality. Right? Just wad it all up into a ball and start talking about divine plurality. And the Trinity is divine plurality too, right? Right. So, we were already talking about that sort of thing. Now, you should give the credit to the Jews here. And Rogers has his own, again, fringe views about the angel of the Lord. Uh, it's basically a different person than Yahweh, but also the same person, which is total nonsense. Okay, so fringe views, his views about the New Testament use of the Old Testament, his views of the Jews were Trinitarian, his off-the-wall theologically motivated misreadings of clear passages about Jesus' lack of knowledge, and finally, just how straightforwardly incoherent his views about God and Jesus are. Now, what happens in the early deity of Christ literature, this new large and constantly growing genre of writings, what the authors constantly do is tap dance around quite how Jesus and God are related. They're closely associated. Jesus shares in his identity, or maybe just has his identity. Uh, God comes in Jesus and as Jesus. They always have kind of one foot in saying they're the same person and one foot in, no, they're really different persons. And there is a general consensus there that you find expressed in many ways that you can't simply collapse Jesus and God. Like That would be a mistake to think that the one just is the other. This is the biggest difference between a popular Jesus is God apologist and these sorts of scholars. There are many examples I could give, but here are two examples of early high Christology scholars who draw back when it comes to just straightforwardly collapsing Jesus and God into the same one. So Larry Hurtado in his book, God and New Testament Theology, and by the way, I interviewed him about this book. It's Trinity's Podcast 100. On page 50, he writes this, There certainly is other evidence that in some populist Christian piety of the ancient world, Jesus was effectively the sole, quote, God to whom prayers and praise were offered. For some early Christians, there was no meaningful distinction in function, relationship, or essence between Jesus and the Father. In short, for Christians in these circles, Jesus effectively eclipsed God. Put another way, Jesus simply became, quote, God, not God the Son, defined in relation to God the Father, but to all intents and purposes, simply, quote, God. Indeed, this may also be true of a lot of populist and theologically untutored forms of Christian piety across the centuries down into our own time. And then in his footnote, he mentions oneness Pentecostals. Yes, this very confusion is exactly what's endorsed by people I call Jesus is God apologists. The eminent New Testament scholar James Dunn in his book, Did the First Christians Worship Jesus? Page 142. The New Testament writers are really quite careful at this point. Jesus is not the God of Israel. He is not the Father. He is not Yahweh. An identification of Jesus with and as Yahweh was an early attempt to resolve the tensions indicated above. It was labeled as modalism, a form of monarchianism. And then he goes on to discuss Richard Bauckham's tortured and unclear language about divine identity, but I don't want to go into that here. Okay, so for a Jesus is God apologist, the way they like to put it is that Jesus is Yahweh himself which is a very new and very not traditional way of trying to express a Trinitarian view, by the way. Yahweh is a proper name, like David or Sam or Dale. It's the name of a self. So is the word Jesus. When they say Jesus is Yahweh, they seem to be thinking that Jesus and Yahweh are one and the same self. Okay, but then what are the, quote, persons of the Trinity? I don't think that they have any clear view about what those are. They'll say the Father and Son are different persons, but then they seem to think that the Father is the same person as Yahweh, the Son is the same person as Yahweh, which would entail, logically, that the Father is the same person as the Son. But they know that's a wrong answer, so they don't say that. They're constraining themselves by Trinitarian language. And I mean, basically their view is that Jesus is Yahweh himself, oh, and also somebody else which is just complete nonsense. It's a non-starter. And that's why the early high Christology people are always kind of flailing about trying to come up with something more subtle to say about Jesus and God, other than that the one just is the other, 
or that they're the same person, and also, by the way, different persons. Right, so Jesus is Yahweh, so they're thinking they're the same person. Oh, but he's also the son of Yahweh. Okay, that means he's a different person. If you're paying attention to issues of logical coherence, you'll see that their views are just incoherent, and so they're really a non-starter for giving a charitable and plausible interpretation of the Bible. I brought this out in my cross-examination time. I'm sure it went over the heads of a lot of apologetics fanboys who usually don't take the time to study logic. But if you want to see this, it's in a YouTube video called How Anthony Rogers Interprets Scripture as Self-Contradictory. So armed with these confusions, they just try to come up with ever more creative ways of collapsing together Jesus and God and ignoring the differences between them. They go out and find scholarship that can be mined for new arguments, and they discard the rest of it. I think that's why my referring to his views as fringe hidden nerve, because he knows he's doing this. He knows he's gravitating to certain very specific parts of the scholarship that can be pressed into service to support his thesis, whether or not those authors quite support his thesis. Or you just have to bone up on lots of Jesus is God proof texts and go to town. Coherence? Uh, that's not something you need to worry your pretty little head about. Now, the second I start to explain why this is incoherent, why if the Father just is God and Jesus just is God, it logically follows that Jesus just as the Father, and the Father just as Jesus. As soon as I start to do that, they say, aha, you're starting with philosophy, aha, philosophical speculation, we don't have time for that garbage. Which is um, really an arrogant and ridiculous position to take. Um, he doesn't know about this type of learning, and so he has the chutzpah to just cast scorn on it and ignore it. But, you know, I think some of the fans will be smarter. The kind of logic I'm employing is really not controversial. It's used throughout philosophy, and it's clearly explained in many present-day logic textbooks. It's really just an extension of our God-given common sense. If his position about Jesus and God is going to turn out to be coherent, he really has to make use of what philosophers call relative identity theory. Mr. Rogers would know this, if he had decided to work through the argument of Trinity's podcast episode 124, my challenge to Jesus as God apologists, or if he had taken the time to learn from Trinity's podcast 271, does your Trinity theory require relative identity? His clearly does, if he wants it to be coherent and not self-contradictory. Now, who are these people who care about coherence? Everybody educated in logic and philosophy or who hasn't lost their common sense, basically. So if you look at the Trinity entry in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy or the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy or the Routledge Encyclopedia of Philosophy, you will see a whole bunch of Christian scholars trying to construct a Trinity theory which isn't demonstrably self-contradictory. They have a number of strategies they employ to avoid incoherence, and one of those is relative identity theory. Are these Unitarians? Nope. Are they rationalists? Not in any bad sense. Not liking contradictions is required by wanting to get at what's true and avoid what's false. The same is true about incarnation theories, you know, theories that Jesus has a divine and human nature. Probably the best place to look for those is a short book called The Incarnation by Roman Catholic analytic theologian Timothy Paul, who I've interviewed a couple of times on the Trinity's podcast. Here, too, you have thinking Christians trying to understand mainstream, small-c Catholic tradition in a way that's coherent. But Jesus as God apologists don't worry about this sort of thing. But you should worry about this sort of thing insofar as you're concerned about the truth of the matter. If you throw in your lot with these Jesus is God apologists, you're just straight up going against reason. You're just declaring that you don't care about whether your claims are coherent or incoherent. When the Trinity's podcast returns, more about the deep culture clash between a Christian philosopher and analytic theologian like me and a Jesus is God apologist like Anthony Rogers. Music
there's a vast disconnect between our points of view, and not just as concerns theology or the interpretation of Mark. In his follow-up discussion with his many YouTube followers, Anthony Rogers said some things that really shocked me. Here's one. He's a Unitarian, and he thinks our position is blasphemous. What? Just like the Jews thought Jesus was blaspheming in Mark 2, Mark 14. And just like Mark says the Jews actually were doing towards Jesus in Mark 15, 29. So in Dale's mind, our view is blasphemous. Bizarre. Totally bizarre statement. Why would I think that? Do you even know what blasphemy is? Blasphemy is like cursing God or disrespecting God. It's not, generally speaking, blaspheming or dishonoring God to have a false theory about God. A false theory that was passed on to one by a venerable tradition. I was a Trinitarian on paper, stage one Trinitarian. For this idea of stages, see Trinity's podcast 302. I was in that sense a Trinitarian for more than half of my Christian life. I don't think I was blaspheming back then. I don't think most Trinitarians are blaspheming now, not just in virtue of being Trinitarians. The only thing I can imagine is that he supposes that my position is blasphemous, and so I must think that about his? That's crazy. That would be a crazy thing to think. But it takes a turn for the worse, and it starts out when he reads a comment from one of his followers. I get the feeling that they have an immense hatred for Christians like the Muslims do. Right, right, right. Immense hatred. Unitarian Christians like me have an immense hatred for Trinitarians. Unbelievable. Yeah, I I agree with you, Sophia. I think these guys have an immense hatred for Christians— and, you know, I'm not saying, you know, that they would go out and incite. Well, I mean, I don't know what I'm saying, because under different circumstances, people reveal what's in their heart. Another bizarro statement. I don't hate Trinitarians. I love them. They are precisely why I wrote my book, What is the Trinity? They are precisely why I try to engage Trinitarians constantly in rational argument to help them think through this issue of Trinity theories and the Bible. And how are the two related? Clearly, I don't hate them. I don't hate my prior self. I don't hate my Trinitarian friends now. When I wrote my short book, What is the Trinity?, which is basically just an invitation to Trinitarian Christians to think about these things, I actually had three evangelical Trinitarian friends read through it and discuss it with me. I wanted to make sure it didn't defend them. None of them took it as a hate letter and rightly so. Generally speaking, Unitarian Christians don't hate Trinitarians any more than mainstream Protestants hate Catholics. Now, yeah, you can find a few sectarian types who in various subtle ways express contempt for Trinitarians. And if that's you, friend, you need to repent. Your attitude should be, there but for the grace of God go I. They're not Trinitarians, generally speaking, because they're especially wicked people. They're Trinitarians because that's what they've been taught. And for whatever reason, they haven't yet undergone a re-examination and reformation of their views about God, His Son, and His Spirit in light of what the New Testament actually says versus what they've been told it says. Again, why would anybody think this about Unitarian Christians in general, much less about me? All I can guess is it's what psychologists call projection, that they feel immense hatred for Unitarian Christians as horrendous heretics, and so they figure that surely these guys must reciprocate, they must also hate us. Well, no, not insofar as we're followers of the Lord Jesus. We don't hate our enemies, we love our enemies, and we pray for those who persecute us. A bit later, Rogers is speculating on, you know, why anybody is paying attention to this doofus tuggy, and he says some interesting things which reveal a total misunderstanding of contemporary Christian philosophy and what I'm doing. So I think it's worth going over. Because he is a philosopher? You'll notice he kept trying to wax philosophical in the debate. Right there. Total and complete misunderstanding. It's not waxing philosophical to try to figure out in my questioning time 
what he means when he says that Jesus is God. He could just be saying that Jesus has a divine nature, and then there would be further questions on what on earth that means, because it could mean several different things. But he didn't take that route. He said about as clearly as he was capable of that he understands Jesus and God to be one in the same, right? Like Mark Twain just is Samuel Clemens, which of course isn't consistent with all the differences between Jesus and God, even given his own theology, right? He thinks God is triune. He doesn't think Jesus is triune. So they can't be one in the same. But that God is triune and isn't, that's just one of a bunch of contradictions implied by his confused views. And now he's going to chest thump a little bit. Then he's going to go on to say some other interesting and wrong-headed things. Now, I'm happy to have a philosophical debate with him if he wants. Mm. That wasn't our debate, right? But mm-hmm. he's mostly just a philosopher. And here's my approach to philosophy. All right. Rogers' approach to philosophy. Here we go. The church, historically, has always said that philosophy is the handmaiden of theology. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that philosophy, in in terms of determining what God has said, what God has revealed, what is true about God, the scriptures trump philosophy. It's the job of philosophy, just like a handmaiden, to come along and serve theology. It's to serve scripture. So we can use philosophy to clarify our points. We can use philosophy to formulate our arguments and that sort of thing. But philosophy can't dictate our understanding of the Bible. It can't tell us that this text can't mean that because, well, this philosophical notion rules that out, right? So philosophy is to take its marching orders from scripture. And that's my approach to things. Dale, on the other hand, wants to begin with philosophy, and that usually means beginning with his own presuppositions, his own philosophical assumptions about what is the case, what can be the case, what's possible, what's not possible. But different philosophical systems have different presuppositions. So, for example, one of his assumptions is if the Father is God, then Jesus can't be God. So what's the underlying assumption there? Well, that God's only one person, such that if the Father is God, Jesus can't be. But what if you don't buy that assumption? What if you think that two persons can both be God? What if you think, like Mark explicitly says, that not only the Father is deity, but the Son is deity? If you don't buy these philosophically important assumptions, then all that's just up in the air in in terms of arriving at truth. So I believe you begin with Scripture and philosophy serves as a handmaiden to theology. Uh, The Bible, God's revelation, gives philosophy its marching orders. Okay, wow, this was just riddled with interesting errors. The biggest error is that he seems to have no understanding of the recent traditions of Christian analytic philosophers. Of course, since we are traditional Christians, we believe in divine revelation. And so we're not going to accept some product of philosophical speculation that we can see to clash with what God has revealed. About the handmaiden metaphor, yeah, sure, in a sense, divine revelation is more important than philosophy, if only for this reason, divine revelation provides knowledge to everyone, and not everyone is capable of philosophical reasoning and philosophical arguments and understanding philosophical theories and things like that. But in another sense, this idea that philosophy just has to kind of stand by idly and wait for theology to finish its work, and then maybe philosophy can somehow come in to help, in one sense, that's ridiculous. And the reason it's ridiculous is that logic and reasoning are part of philosophy. We don't want interpretations of scripture which make it out to be incoherent, which have the author to be contradicting himself. Charity requires that we try to avoid interpretations like that. What is the discipline that helps you to determine whether or not an overall set of claims is consistent or whether it's incoherent? That's philosophy, specifically within philosophy, logic. And there are also difficult passages, for instance, in Paul, in which there's a complicated argument going on. And to interpret the passage, you really have to be able to follow the flow of that argument. What is the human discipline which trains a person to analyze arguments so as to understand what the premises are and how the conclusions supposedly derive from the premises? It's philosophy, and specifically logic. Logic. 
So there's no way to take your mind, your reasoning powers, your interest in the difference between truth and falsity. There's no way to kind of set that aside and interpret scripture and then come back to it. Training of this sort just helps you to exercise those God-given muscles that you're expected to have as a reader of a human book, whether an inspired book or even just an ordinary human book. So the idea that you just sort of uh, philosophize about what's possible and then uh, come to Scripture with this and uh, you have this grid in your mind that then you have to force Scripture into, no recent Christian philosophers accept that approach, really. One thing that Rogers and I think, as far as I can tell, all Jesus has got apologists don't understand about philosophy is not everything that philosophers talk about is a philosophical theory or something that has to do with philosophical speculations. One thing that philosophers do is we separate out what's known from what's not known. We separate out what's known from what's merely speculated or postulated. And some types of philosophers, especially due to the kind of Aristotle and Thomas Reed tradition, talk about things that all humans are able to know just as humans with ordinary experience. Another good example of this in philosophy is Alvin Plantinga and the many, many people, including me, who have been influenced by him. One way to put it is that certain truths are properly basic. They're known, but not on the basis of other things that one knows. Another way to describe these truths is to say that they are self-evident, that basically a human being just has to think about them and they will thereby know that they're true. And by the way, I did a bunch of podcasts in a row about self-evident truths and how that relates to speculating about God and Jesus. This is podcast number 219 through 223, so you can check that out for more examples of relevant self-evident truths that can help us to interpret Scripture. And among many different kinds of examples, this would include, say, the mathematical truth that 2 plus 2 is 4. So if you have some philosophical theory about free will or universals or the nature of human persons, no, you can't then, you know, after you theorize, insist that scripture be crammed into that mold. But because philosophy deals with things that all people know or that all people should know, it helps us to find some tools which are going to be presupposed by the scriptures and by just about any human writing. Again, just take basic mathematical competence. Scripture doesn't teach you this. Scripture assumes it. You need to bring that basic competence to Scripture when you read it. And Scripture isn't going to change your understanding of mathematics. You're not going to suddenly think, oh, because of this passage, 2 plus 2 isn't 4, it's really 5. Okay, but there are other truths like this, such as the truths of logic, such as that this is a valid form of argument, what in the Middle Ages they called modus ponens. If you have one premise, P, and another premise, if P, then Q, then the conclusion follows Q. No matter what claims you substitute for P and Q there, you're going to have a valid argument, one in which it's impossible for all the premises to be true while the conclusion is false. So, the basic truths of mathematics, the basic truths about what follows from what logically, just a basic understanding of making inferences, Those are things we bring to Scripture, not things we learn from Scripture. And we need those tools to understand what's going on in various passages. Another area of self-evident truths concerns our fundamental concept of numerical identity, or just the relation being the same thing as. This is a relation which is symmetrical. If A equals B, then B equals A. It's transitive. If A just is B and B just is C, then it follows that A just is C. And it's reflexive. For anything that there is, it has to bear this relation to itself. So it's a very strange relation. It's not a relation between different things. To realize that things are identical is to realize that uh, counting them as two would be double counting. And in some cases, you're collapsing what you had previously thought were two things down into one thing. You're realizing that in your mind, no, there's really just one thing there. The famous uh, ancient example of this is the morning star and the evening star, which are two different bright heavenly bodies that ancient people could observe. And we've known for some time that these are just the planet Venus. 
So we say the morning star just is the evening star. We collapse them, the one just is the other. Now, because of what we know, not speculate, not believe, not theorize, because of the things we know about this relation of identity, who all of us, even Anthony Rogers, even every Jesus is God apologist, when they're talking about other subjects, one of the things we understand about this is that things identical to the same thing have to be identical to one another. You can give a proof of this in formal logic. I'm not going to waste your time with it right now, but it's, it's easy to see, right? If A just is C and B just is C, well, then it also has to be that A just is B. And this is precisely where the Jesus is God people are utterly confused, and they just simply refuse to learn about the logic of identity, which is found in any contemporary logic textbook. Again, these things aren't really part of any philosophical theory. They are just an attempt to codify and to systematize common sense. Logic is just by definition topic neutral. It concerns what are and what are not valid arguments whether the subject is theology or history or biology or basket weaving. They think the Father just is God, and they think the Son just is God, but they don't realize, or at least they're not willing to admit, that they've just committed in saying those two things to the claim that the Father just is the Son. But of course, it's wrong to collapse the Father and Son. There are differences between them. So Rogers seems to have that confusion. And at one point in the debate, he decided that he was going to you know, drop some theological deepness on me. And he said, well, if you want to get philosophical, what my view is, is that the Son just is the divine nature, and the Father just is the divine nature. However, the Father is different from the Son. Well, those three things just can't be true, just by logic. Never mind what the divine nature is. Again, things identical to the same thing thereby have to be identical to one another. So this was just another example of his confusion when it comes to reasoning about identity statements. Yeah, so I don't have a philosophical assumption that God can only be one person. And the reason for that is because person can mean many things, and philosophers don't mean one thing by the term. When a Trinitarian says that God is three, quote, persons, my first question is, what do you mean by the term person? There isn't one meaning for that. There are at least a couple of meanings for it. You tell me what you mean, and then we'll continue on the discussion from there. In fact, I went into this whole area precisely with the hope and the assumption that there would be some interpretation of this language that God is three persons that makes sense, that's not incoherent, and that fits the Bible. I went into this subject as a Trinitarian evangelical, hoping to defend, quote, the Trinity. But of course, the first stage in critical thinking about any matter is, okay, exactly what claims are we talking about? And that led me into a lot of difficult reading and investigation, because I found that smart Trinitarians had said several different kinds of things in the hope of finding a Trinitarian theology that is coherent and fits with Scripture and later traditions. And it's not, by the way, just Dale Tuggy that understands these self-evident truths. If you look at the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy article on the Trinity, and you consider the various authors discussed there, Peter Van Inwagen, Brian Leftow, William Lane Craig, James Anderson, every single last one of them understands this kind of reasoning that I'm talking about. And with the exception of Van Inwagen, maybe, because of his views about relative identity, they accept these self-evident truths. Their theories are incorporating this type of critical thinking in them. So, in short, there are multiple approaches to, quote, the Trinity, what that is supposed to amount to, which don't involve ignoring careful reasoning about identity statements. Jesus has got apologists seem just to not know this. They don't want to know it. You know where I first learned these self-evident truths about identity and that this was applicable to the issue of Jesus and God, I learned it from Dr. J.P. Moreland at Biola University. I believe it was in a metaphysics class. 
And to paraphrase, he said something like this, guys, when we say Jesus is God, this can't mean that Jesus and God are numerically the same. It can't mean that they're numerically identical because then whatever is true of one would have to be true of the other. Right? He's saying that as a Trinitarian, God is tripersonal. He doesn't want to say that Jesus is tripersonal. Okay, so then you have to distinguish between Jesus and God. You can't hold that the one just is the other. It's not consistent with the differences between them. So there's no uh, weird theory here by Tuggy. There's no you know creative thing that Tuggy came up with. These are self-evident truths that are known and worked with and around by thousands of people who have just taken upon themselves to understand identity statements and how to construct arguments with statements that affirm or deny numerical identity. So in no sense did I go into this matter assuming that God must be one person. Nor do I assume that if Jesus is God, then the Father can't also be God. The reason I don't assume that is it can mean many things to say that someone or other, quote, is God. Could they both be divine? Depends what you mean by divine. Is each one a God? Do they share a divine nature? These are all things to consider, and I have considered them in my work very thoroughly. But just like I know that 1 plus 1 is 2, and that 4 minus 3 is 1, I know that if Jesus just is God, and the Father just is God, it would have to also be that Jesus just is the Father. And it's also self-evident that if you can discover a simultaneous difference between one thing and another, then they must be two, because they couldn't be one. So one and the same thing can't be and not be a certain way at a certain time. Are there simultaneous differences between Jesus and the Father? Yes, according to any Christian. Check out podcast 124 on that. All right, so the whole picture of what recent Christian philosophers are up to, what sort of assumptions I bring when I'm doing theology, you know, how I'm corrupted by this philosophical conviction somehow that God can only be one person, it's all just pure imagination. He's just trying to figure out why does Tuggy think what Tuggy thinks. He hasn't read enough Tuggy. He hasn't taken the time to. The things he's saying here are kind of a just-so story, so he can attempt to understand why I think what I think, even though I'm looking at the same sources that he's looking at. I am looking at the same sources he's looking at. I don't, quote, start with philosophy. What's different is the degree and kind of critical thinking that's going into interpreting a book like Mark. There's also a difference, I think, in understanding the historical context of the first century discussions. Really, the fact that my degrees are in philosophy, it's kind of a red herring. It's kind of a distraction. And the Jesus is God apologists, most of them do find it very distracting, but it's really not relevant to why I think what I think. There are tons of Unitarian Christians who have figured out these same things with or without any help from philosophy, and the ways that we're reasoning about the texts are very similar. And this is because we're just using our God-given common sense and comparing Scripture with Scripture. You don't have to be a philosopher to come to these conclusions. I didn't come to these conclusions because I'm a philosopher. I came to these conclusions simply by reevaluating mainstream traditional theology in light of the New Testament. And my philosophical training, I'm very grateful for it. It's been helpful to me in carefully making and evaluating arguments, and also in carefully understanding sources in their historical context. Those are the things that have helped me from philosophy. But you don't have to have those things to come to be a Unitarian Christian, and in fact, most of us have not studied any philosophy. When the Trinity's podcast returns, more about Roger's confusion of Jesus with God and his misreading of the first portion of the Gospel according to Mark. 
So if you throw in your lot with these internet famous Jesus is God apologists, you're setting yourself against reason. You're assuming that thousands of educated Christians who have studied logic are just a bunch of dopes and are just, uh, you know, casting their philosophical assumptions onto scripture. And another thing you're doing to your own detriment, and I'll talk about this in the rest of this episode, but also in next week's episode, is betting against the bulk of conservative Christian Bible scholarship. And this is something I wish I knew going into the debate. Uh, Mr. Rogers hadn't said much about Mark that I could find on YouTube before. I didn't realize just how much of even the most conservative modern scholarship he just rejects out of hand. If you were only to listen to Anthony Rogers, you'd come away thinking that the Greek word kurios simply is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew name Yahweh. But that's just wrong. As I said in the debate, look in the lexicon. What's true is that when Jews would translate the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, they thought God's name was too holy to pronounce uh, or even to write, and so they would substitute hakurios, the Lord, for the Hebrew word Yahweh. So it can be a substitute for the divine name. Even in these cases, however, kurios is still not a proper name. You could say it's a polite euphemism, basically. Again, because of their assumption that the divine name is too holy to be uttered or even written. But at the other far end of its meaning, it can just mean sir. It can be a polite form of address. One notch up from that, it can mean master or boss. This is the sense of it, by the way, in Mark 2, when Jesus says that he is the master of the Sabbath, that he's able to pronounce about Sabbath law questions. He's not saying he's the Yahweh of the Sabbath. That's nonsense. So that's three different meanings for this term. Interestingly, there's a new New Testament meaning also to use kurios, or ha kurios, the Lord, to refer to Jesus as opposed to God. So in New Testament teaching, 1 Corinthians 8, Ephesians 4, there's not only one God, but also, guys, guess what? There's one Lord. He's not double counting. He's not saying two different names for the same one there. So I was kind of shocked in the debate when Rogers didn't even seem to grant that kurios is ambiguous between God and Jesus, because I knew that scholars worry about this all the time. They know it can refer to God or to Jesus, so Okay, for this instance here, in this chapter, which one does it mean here? Usually it's pretty clear by the context which is meant. Interestingly, there are a few ambiguous cases where some scholars will say it refers to one, some the other, and it's just less clear to us whether or not it was less clear to the original readers. So when you realize how ambiguous the term kurios is, then you see, oh, if I'm going to say that calling Jesus kurios is calling him Yahweh, I'm going to have to argue for that. How do I know it's not one of these other three uses of the term? Now, Rogers rested the bulk of his case really, I think, on just a straight, confused misreading of the opening couple of paragraphs of the book, ignoring the actual main thesis of the book, which is repeated like a drumbeat through the entire book, including the first verse. He's like, no, the real thesis is right here when he quotes Isaiah, prepare the way for the Lord. Now, some of the best recent commentators, like Adila Yabro Collins in her Mark commentary in the Hermeneia series, they recognize this point. She writes, most immediately, the, quote, Lord in the quotation is to be identified with Jesus, that John's task is to prepare the way for the activity of Jesus is implied in the context in several ways. The sequence of events in the narrative of this passage implies that John prepares the way for Jesus. Further, the sayings attributed to John in verses 7 and 8 imply the same conclusion. John proclaims that one mightier than he is coming after him who will baptize the people in the Holy Spirit— that this coming one is Jesus and not God is made clear by the reference to his, Jesus' sandals, in verse 7. This conclusion is supported by the subsequent association of Jesus with the Spirit in verse 10. 
that John's activity was a preparation for that of Jesus is further suggested by the statement in verse 14 that the public activity of Jesus began only after the end of John's. Now, if you look at the blog post for this episode at trinities.org, you can see an image there I made of this text from the New Revised Standard Translation. And what I've done is I've color-coded the names and the pronouns, etc., that refer to the three different characters here. The three characters are Jesus, the Son of God. That's one character. I've got those references in blue. Then there's God. I've got those references in red. And then there's John. I've put those references in green. And in the quotation, God is talking about sending a messenger, that's John, who will prepare your way. Okay, God's talking about someone else. Who is this someone else? He's referred to as the Lord. You know that you can't confuse Jesus with God because of several obvious differences between Jesus and God that are presupposed in the passage. This keeping the characters straight is just a part of basic reading comprehension. So we know that the Son of God is just going to be someone other than God. You don't describe someone as their own son. You know that Jesus has sandals. God doesn't. Jesus came from Nazareth. God is everywhere. Jesus was baptized by John. God, we don't think, has ever been baptized. Jesus comes out of the water. Jesus, not God, sees the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And then there is a voice that comes from heaven, and the reader is to understand this is God speaking, not Jesus, not John the Baptist, saying, you are my son, etc. So the suggestion that Jesus is assumed or taught to be Yahweh here, it's just straight up confused. It's confusing together what are clearly two different characters in the narrative. Now, what he argued, and here's where we get into the fringe views, is that in the Hebrew original of this text from Isaiah, the Lord that's coming, that's Yahweh. The Lord, Hakurios in Greek, therefore must refer to the same one in this fulfillment that's being here alleged. Of course, this is a mistake. God doesn't say, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of me who will prepare my way. You know, that this person will make my path straight. He says, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. God here is talking to somebody else. Now, when you're committed to the nonsense, like Mr. Rogers is, that the angel of the Lord is Yahweh himself, but also a different person than Yahweh, then you have no trouble here thinking that Jesus is the Lord, that that is, Jesus is Yahweh himself, and yet Jesus is a different person than Yahweh. But these just aren't Mark's ideas. In fact, these aren't ideas that you see in Christian theology until the 4th century, angel of the Lord notwithstanding. And in next week's episode, I'll talk more about why this is a fringe view, that an Old Testament prophecy, when it's fulfilled, has to have the same meaning and the same reference that it had back when it was originally spoken. That view just can't be sustained at all in light of modern Bible scholarship. But before I get to that, I want to talk about an idea that Rogers came back to over and over, that there are signature acts of Yahweh, things in principle that only God can do, and Jesus does these, and therefore we just have to conclude that Jesus is God. One thing to note about the argument is that there's no reason to think that only God can part the water, only God can forgive sins. It's easy to imagine that God should delegate these things, so there doesn't seem to be any impossibility In the cross-examination, I effectively refuted any claim that it's just impossible for anyone other than God to, say, walk on water or calm the wind and the waves or forgive sins. There's no reason to think that, in principle, only God can do that, because it doesn't seem contradictory for other beings to do that. In fact, it seems like an all-powerful being could very well authorize other beings to do precisely those actions. Rogers did not have anything to say about this. Uh, Maybe you could think he fell back on the lesser claim that, okay, well, only God does these things. He likes the phrase that these are signature actions of God, things distinctive of God. Uh, Maybe not things that only God can do, but only things that God, in fact, does. The thing about these signature God actions, and there are such, I think, in the Old Testament, 
is that they don't exclude God acting by means of a human agent. So, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 46, God is insulting the idols at the start of this chapter. Verse 5, To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me as though we were alike? A little further down, I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not done, saying, My purpose shall stand and I will fulfill my intention calling a bird of prey from the east, the man for my purpose from a far country. I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have planned, and I will do it. What's distinctive of God is knowing in advance what's going to happen, because God is provident over human history. So calling out the future accurately before it occurs is a signature act of God. Is this something that can also be done by a human? Yes, because as you see in this very book, a human prophet will come out and say things that are going to happen in the future. That doesn't mean that human is God. That means that God is doing something that these alleged deities of the nations, as represented by the idols, can't do, either because they're not real or because they're not that powerful and they're not in control of history. This is a paradigm signature act of Yahweh. He says, Basically, that only he can accurately predict the future because he's in charge of history. That's right, but that doesn't preclude him acting through human agents. So when Isaiah and other prophets correctly predict the future, that doesn't show that they're God because they're doing signature acts of God or doing things only God can do or that only God actually does. It's really God working through them. So is it a prerogative of God to forgive sins? Yes, because he's the chief person who's been offended in sin. Can he delegate this to another? Yes, according to the New Testament. We talked about the passages in the debate. In next week's episode of the Trinity's podcast, I'll explain how Anthony Rogers and probably some other Jesus is God apologists as well set themselves against even the results of contemporary conservative Bible scholarship. This week's thinking music has been the track Dream Blaze by Little Glass Men. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org where you can listen to or download that entire track. for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.